Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Now joining us again to discuss the coming elections in Venezuela is Gregory Wilpert. Gregory is the founder of VenezuelaAnalysis.com. He's the author of the book Changing Venezuela by Taking Power. He's an adjunct professor of political science at Brooklyn College in New York, a longtime resident of Venezuela. And his wife is the Consul General of Venezuela in New York. Thanks for joining us, Gregory. Hi, thanks for having me. So uh, w when we look at the sort of Chavez model as compared to the Lula model, which is generally the debate that seems to take, to take place in Latin America, uh, one, one of the big differences has been the willingness of Chavez, especially recently, to nationalize certain uh, sectors of the re uh, natural resource industries. He's uh, nationalized gold mines, some other sectors uh, of the economy. Um, how is that fitting or sitting in the election campaign? Are, are people in favor of that? And, and what so far seems to be the uh, success or failures of that kind of policy? Well, in terms of uh, how people are seeing it, generally, uh, I think it's been viewed relatively favorably because in the, some cases, it's actually led to lower prices. For example, the telephone company uh, has lowered telephone rates. The electricity company has lowered electricity rates. So in that sense, uh, people have generally favored it. And of course, uh, the na full nationalization of uh, the oil industry, that is, it was already nationalized, but they nationalized uh, other aspects of it, uh, has led to greater oil revenues. So in that case, uh, in those cases, uh, the public has generally favored it. As a matter of fact, it's favored so much that even the opposition presidential candidate, Enrique Capriles Radonsky, has said that um, if he were elected president, he would have to review every nationalization and to see whether or not to reverse them. That is, it's not said that they will automatically reverse all of the nationalizations or anything like that. Um, but there are many problems still with um, the state-run enterprises, especially with some of the old ones, which run into problems. They're larger macroeconomic problems that, um, for example, the steel industry and the aluminum processing industry, which have really declined in their production to a large extent also because uh, they're having a hard time exporting and partly because of uh, management problems. And so that's, um, that's been a bit of a, uh, a problem for the government that uh, it's been struggling to deal with. We talked about that a little bit in our previous interview, the, the, the weakness of, of the culture of uh, administration in government uh, and, and a lot of the, in these state en enterprises. Uh, what, what's your thinking on the sort of underpinning reasons for this? I mean, it would somehow, and to some extent, it kind of beefs or strengthens the argument of the government should get out of this stuff if it can't manage it. Well, um, just because it's in private hands doesn't always mean that it's going to be better managed necessarily. So um, that's not, uh, I don't think, the, the real litmus test or the real solution for uh, these issues. The real problem is trying to get rid of um, kind of the cronyism that often exists within the management culture in um, these kinds of industries. Uh, so that's, and then also there's the constant effort, for example, for the, uh, some of the industries are being turned over to workers but many of the workers themselves uh, aren't very clear on how to uh, manage in the sense that uh, there's a lot of internal struggles of whether uh, to what extent they should take care of uh, societal interests versus their own interests as workers and so on. And so there's a lot, it ends up being a lot of conflicts within the industry. Uh, and um, so the, the, the key, I think, is uh, really trying to install um, perhaps a, a more kind of, well, for lack of a better term, a, a, a more professional management culture, but that's not far easier said than done, of course. Right, and, and one of the big issues, other than crime, that has always been the accusation, at least, is the idea that there's corruption in government, in, in, in the army, as well as throughout the private sector as well. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about campaigns being waged to, to root out corruption. Uh, how successful have they been, and, 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 and what's happening on that front? Well, I mean, on the one hand, uh, corruption is certainly perceived to be a major problem in Venezuela. But uh, there's an interesting, some interesting studies have been conducted over the past couple of years comparing Venezuela to other countries in Latin America. And if you make those comparisons, even though the perception of corruption, and actually the same goes for crime, is a lot higher than in, uh, all of Latin, in most of other Latin American countries, the actual in incidence of corruption, that is, if you ask people if they personally have experienced or know of experiences of corruption, uh, in, in the people don't answer uh, more frequently uh, that they've been 
uh, had experience with these uh, problems than, than they do in other countries. So in other words, the actual incidence seems to be comparable, but the perception is much higher. Um, so that, having said that, uh, the government, of course, is uh, trying to address it in various ways, um, usually uh, through by installing uh, people who are professional managers or better managers, but uh, you know, there's as many successes as there are failures. So uh, it's, it's a constant struggle, and uh, like I said, there there's, doesn't seem to be a clear concept as to how to address this problem coherently. And how successful has it been in terms of collecting taxes? Because that was going to be one of the big issues, is that there was going to be real tax collection and cracking down on elites that didn't pay taxes. How successful has that been? Well, that actually is one of the institutions that has been better managed, uh, the tax collection agency. And that's a, one of the shining examples, actually. It's been very efficient and very uh, methodical in tracking down. As a matter of fact, uh, hardly a day passes in Venezuela where you don't see some stories that have been closed uh, for tax evasion. Uh, and so this is a, a, a very, this is one of the, the main success stories as for an institution that has been thoroughly reformed and, and made into a very efficient institution. And to what extent is foreign policy an issue in the election? Chavez's foreign policy has been very openly and overtly what he calls anti-imperialist, anti-U.S. imperialist. Uh, you know, he's, he's maintained friendly relations with a lot of countries that the United States considers enemies. I guess they consider Chavez's Venezuela kind of a more or less an enemy, even though they buy a big whack of their oil from it. Um, is foreign policy at all an issue? It is to some extent, but it's really a minor issue. That is, uh, usually when um, foreign policy comes up, it's mostly in terms of the oil that Venezuela sends to Cuba or to other countries in Latin America at, at very low um, financing rates. And uh, people question that, and that's one issue that the government might be vulnerable on. But in terms of the actual kind of strategic alliances that Venezuela has with governments such as Iran or, or Syria or others, that um, even though uh, many people might feel uncomfortable with it, one has to keep in mind that Venezuela has a very significant um, Arabic population, and so there's, I don't think it uh, plays that much of a role, uh, these kinds of alliances, especially since Venezuela has historically always been allied um, through OPEC to uh, the Middle East. And just to touch on that a bit, uh, it may not be much of an, a big issue in terms of the election, but it's an issue that is very, uh, what you can say, confusing to a lot of people that consider themselves progressive about his relationship with regimes like the Iranians and the Syrians, not in terms of his support for their opposition to any kind of foreign interference or intervention, but in terms of his lack of support for any kind of struggles for democracy within those countries. Well, Chavez clearly... Um uh, favors uh, the anti-imperialist position over any kind of uh, anti-capitalist uh, uh, struggle on the international stage. I mean, this is an old debate within the left, um, and it's very. I think personally, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, but I mean, he he sees the anti-imperialist element as being more important. And uh, therefore, it's not that he's opposed to uh, the democracy movements in, uh, in these countries, but uh, he has, uh, to some extent, expressed some, um, some uh, questions about to what extent uh, they're all uh, completely homegrown. And, uh, and like I said, uh, he basically emphasizes his relationship with those uh, leaders uh, and t has tended to ignore uh, the, the actual movements on the ground. Like in, in Iran, for example, we've interviewed representatives of the Iranian trade union movement who are, I, I would, in my opinion, are every bit as anti-imperialist as Chavez is, but they're also fighting a, a theocracy and a dictatorship and for rights in Iran, and, and they feel very, in their words, betrayed by Chavez's such close friendship with Ahmadinejad and, and kind of supporting this idea that the, all the opposition movement in Iran is essentially foreign-sponsored and all of that. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that they would feel betrayed. Um, and uh, Chavez himself, I think, has a very blinkered vision as to what's going on in these countries. Uh, that is, uh, he uh, hears the negative press reports about these countries and uh, generally feels that, well, he, since he's received so much negative press, he's very skeptical about the negative press the leaders of these countries are receiving and therefore generally actually doesn't believe a lot of what uh, the press reports are about what's happening within those countries.
So much foreign interference in Venezuela and so much of the quote-unquote democracy movement in Venezuela has so many uh, foreign-sponsored, I mean, U.S.-sponsored ties and U.S. money. Uh, I guess he assumes that's the, that's the same thing that's going on in the other countries. And to, and to a large extent, it is. It's just the question is, does it, is it the same weight as, as it might be in a place like Venezuela? Yeah, exactly. And it's very difficult, I think, for somebody such as Chavez to really have a clear idea of what's going on, especially since... Uh, his advisors on foreign policy tend to be people who, um, how should I say, the uh, people who, um, who who generally don't question his own uh, views on these issues. So uh, your prognosis for the elections, as long as things sort of stay the way they are, Chavez campaigns, uh, given the polling, it looks like Chavez will ta have another term. And, uh, and, and then I guess the real issue will be, can they execute uh, you know, more ably than they have in the past. Yes, that's, of course, the issue that the opposition is campaigning on. They're basically saying right now, uh, essentially, that they're going to implement Chavez's program only better. <laughs> so um, that shows to some extent uh, Chavez's own success in his program because it's obviously very popular. And they're just, their main emphasis has really been to bring more efficiency and more crime-fighting capability. Well, Chavez has always shown he knows how to execute during an election campaign. Thanks very much for joining us, Gregory. My pleasure. Thanks. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.